Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to our guests who are worshiping with us. We're very glad that you are here to worship our God and Savior with us. Today we look at another story from the Old Testament that finds its fulfillment in our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus, the story of Joseph. You can read more about our summer sermon series on the inside cover of your your service folder. May God bless our worship this morning. We'll open by singing, I'm but a stranger here. my Lord's right hand. Heaven is my fatherland. Heaven is my home. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. We confess. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. 
We join in singing the doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Please stand. God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is from Genesis chapter 37, the first 11 verses, the story of Joseph. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he had brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, that is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him a richly ornamented robe for, a robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His, his brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Our psalm today is Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. The mighty Lord is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We continue with the story of Joseph. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. <clears throat> so he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. 
Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianites merchant, Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. All right. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, In mourning I will go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Thus far, the words of God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> the gospel for this Sunday is from Matthew chapter 20. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. He, she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel, the good news of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We'll join in singing the hymn, Lord of Glory, You Have Bought Us.
Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The words of God that we're going to focus on are from Genesis chapters 37 through 50, especially chapter 37 and then the words of Joseph in chapter 50 that conclude the story. As for you, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The words of God. The Holy Spirit must have a lot to teach us from the life of Joseph. The life of Joseph spans almost one-third of the book of Genesis. And who else is in the book of Genesis? The likes of Abraham and Noah and Adam and Eve the creation story that we heard last week. Joseph, the story of Joseph, spans almost one-third of the book of Genesis. There's a lot in the life of of Joseph. And the story of Joseph and his family, well, it reads like a somewhat tragic story, at least at first, doesn't it? A somewhat dysfunctional family, to say the least. A father who plays favorites, a son who is the favored son who seems to play up his favored position, and some sibling rivalry that maybe puts other sibling rivalries to shame, makes maybe a sibling rivalry rivalry that you might have experienced look like only a little spat compared to this. None of us would actually threaten to sell a brother or sister and then actually follow through on such a thing. But that's what happened in the family of Joseph. Do you remember how we get to Joseph in in the line of the patriarchs? You have Abraham. Abraham is promised that his offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and and that his descendants will inherit the land of Canaan. We know it as the land of Israel. And Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had twins named Jacob and Esau. And you might remember that Jacob tricked or deceived his brother Esau into giving him the birthright. When Esau found out about this deception, this trickery, Jacob then fled for his life. He ran to his uncle's home, Uncle Laban, and there he worked, and he fell in love with Rachel. But then the one who had deceived was also deceived. Jacob was tricked into marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah. Maybe you remember this. And then Finally, after working seven more years for his uncle Laban, then finally he was allowed to marry Rachel. Well, after ten sons to Leah and some other of the servants in his household, Jacob finally had a son with his favorite wife, Rachel. And that son was Joseph. That's how we get to Joseph in the story of the patriarchs. And so you can somewhat see why it is that Jacob favored this one son, Joseph, of his 12 sons that he would have. He favored Joseph because it was this son that was given to him in his old age to his favorite wife, Rachel. Jacob or Joseph was favored of all the boys. Now, I come from a family of four boys. And maybe some of you come from a family of of more children, maybe even five to to ten or or more children. The first thing that I know from being in a family of of four boys is that you need to eat quickly when you are in the house. Because if you don't eat quickly, you may not get seconds. You may not get some of the, the, the good food that has been put out. The other thing that if you talk to those who have many other siblings, that if you start to annoy one of those siblings who's older than you, you might just start to have all of those siblings that are older than you begin to turn on you. Joseph, it seems, didn't seem to get this. Joseph didn't seem to grasp this all too well. When the older sons began to cause trouble while they were in the field in the flo- with their flocks, what did Joseph do? He went back to his father and he began to tattle on them. He began to tell, tell what his brothers were doing. 
Now the brothers know that their father favored Joseph. The, the older brothers all knew this. They knew of his favored status, and this was going to get him into trouble. Their hatred for Joseph was building, though. And it doesn't stop there. Then there's this coat, the multicolored coat that Joseph is given. Some believe that it was a, a, a coat that would have been worn by royalty back then. And so Joseph has this special coat that he wears that none of the other children have. And then there are the dreams. You would think that with all going on between Joseph and his brothers, and with everything going on between Joseph and his father, you would think that if this dream came to you about your, your brothers bowing down to you, you might just keep that dream to yourself. Not Joseph. Joseph decides that he's going to let everyone know, hey guys, guess what happened last night? You're not going to believe what happened. I had this dream. It was about, we were in the field and we were binding grain up. We were binding grain and you're not going to believe what happened, but your sheaves of grain started bowing down to my sheaves of grain. You can imagine the, the look on the faces of his brothers. Maybe a dumbfounded look. They even said to him, is this really going to happen? Do you really believe that this is going to happen, that you will rule over us and we will bow down to you? Could this really be? They probably walked away complaining and grumbling more about their brother Joseph. You'd think then that when Joseph has another dream, that this time perhaps he would keep it to himself. But not, at, not this time either. The next dream that he has, the sun and the moon are bowing down to him. The sun and the moon representing his father and mother. And the stars, 11 stars his, representing his 11 brothers, are bowing down to him. And he feels the need to share this dream again with his brothers. His father Jacob rebukes him. His father Jacob even, even rebukes him and, and tells him not to speak of this anymore. His brothers obviously are growing in, in envy and jealousy towards their brother. Now one thing's for sure, it, it seems that Joseph knew that this dream was from God. This dream seems, it seems that he knows that this dream is from God. And with, with the circumstances that he is going to run into in the future, he's going to need this dream. He's going to need to hold on tightly to this dream that God has given him, this promise that God has given him that there's something better off in the future, something better in the distance for him. I'll tell you, dear Christian, there are non-Christians and even Christians who will begin to hate, to hate you when you hold on to God's big promises. When you begin to hold on to what God's Word says. Like last week, we talked about how God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour days. And we talked about what that means for us. It means that we as creatures of God, we are accountable to the Creator. And when people hear that, that might make them upset. They don't want to be accountable to the Creator when we talk about there being a right and a wrong, that God has, has said that there are things that are right and there are wrong, that there is sin in this world, people do not always want to hear about that, and they may hate us. They may call us closed-minded in other names. When you stand up for what is right and wrong, people may have hatred. You have big promises of God, though, to hold on to. He says, come to me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. He says, cast all your care and anxiety on me because I care for you. You have big promises from God that all things will work out for, for good. You have the promise from God that, that you have peace, peace that will last forever between you and God because of the forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus. And when the world hears of these things, when, when some hear of these things, they will, they will hate those things. They may even hate you. And when things go from bad to worse, when things seem to be going from bad to worse in our life, it can be tempting for us then to doubt God's promises, those big promises that He has given to us. 
Joseph teaches us, though, that it's best to hold on to these promises because as we're about to go through the list of all the things and the circumstances that he goes through, we'll see that Joseph keeps a pretty good attitude through all of this. He holds on to the big promises that God gives him. Things do go from bad to worse for Joseph. His brother's envy and jealousy of him turns to outright hatred of Joseph. We should note well, as you listen to this story, look what happens. Look what happens when hatred and envy and jealousy are allowed to brew and to stir within the heart. Look at what it leads to for the brothers. A plan is quickly hatched as they see Joseph coming over the desert hills and they see Joseph coming toward him in, the, in his multicolored coat. A, qu- a plan is hatched to kill him. Now his brother Reuben quickly speaks up. Reuben was the eldest of the family, probably is the one who has to report back to dad. And so he says, well, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the cistern here. Maybe thinking that, well, maybe I'll have some time to figure out what to do and get him out of the cistern later and we'll take him back to dad and it'll be as if nothing happened maybe. Reuben convinces them to put him in the cistern. And then you get to chapter 37, verse 25. If you're following along in your Bible, Uh, I'll just read again, though, verse 25. You get to where you see the brothers are the most calloused at this point. After they've they've come up with a plan, well, let's not kill him. Let's, Let's make some money off of this and sell him. It says, they sat down to eat their meal. As Joseph is there in the cistern, probably perhaps begging for his life, wondering what's going to happen next to him, They sit down to eat a meal. You can see where their sin has led to, their calloused hearts. And as this brotherly banter is probably going on and maybe even shouts of ridicule at their brother Joseph, they see a caravan coming along in the desert, the Ishmaelites, and so they decide, well, let's sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. And so they decide to sell him for 20 shekels of silver. As if that's all not bad enough, then they decide to all go in on a lie to their father. They dip his coat that they had stripped him of, they dip his coat in some goat's blood, and they take it back to the father for him to draw his own conclusions. But what's even more sad is that they they go along with it. Knowing that Joseph, their brother, is still alive, they allow their father, how cruel is it that they allow their father to live now in this lie that their brother has been killed. It leads, you see what happens when envy and jealousy and hatred are unrepented of, left unchecked. It leads to one sin after another. Sin compounds itself. This is, this is what happens in our world. This is how God has set up our world, that one consequence of sin leads to more consequences of sin. And when we see that in our own life, when it happens that we see the consequences of sin, perhaps our own or of others, we need to be reminded to return to our God and repent of our own sin to repent of our own sin, to not make excuses for our sin, but to turn back to God and to repent. Well, Joseph ends up in Egypt, we're told. He ends up in Egypt and he actually doesn't sulk in his position, in his service as a a slave. He actually ends up becoming in charge of an official's house, Potiphar's house. But things, while things seem to be looking Looking good for Joseph now, things quickly take a turn for the worst as he is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of trying to seduce her, and so he is thrown in jail. And now he ends up in jail. Again, Joseph, though, doesn't seem to sulk. He seems to hold a good attitude through all of this. Joseph is even in jail, put in charge of the other occupants of the jail. God is still working good through this whole situation, and he spends a while, a few years in jail, and then there are some dreams that are given to a cupbearer and a baker. 
Joseph interprets the dreams for them. One is going to be restored to his position as cupbearer, and the other one, the baker, is going to be executed. And it happens just exactly as Joseph said it would. And Joseph reminded the cupbearer, when you are restored to your position, maybe put in a good word for me with Pharaoh. But the cupbearer forgot about him. So he spent two more years in prison. Sold as a slave by his brothers works his way to a respected position in the house of Potiphar, thrown into jail unjustly. Now he's languishing in prison. Finally, he is going to get out of prison a little bit later. He's on this roller coaster in his life, and yet through all of this, through it all, he keeps a good attitude. And why is that? I think that Joseph was able to hold on to the big promises that God had given him, that there was something better in the distance. That God was preparing something good out of all these bad circumstances. God was going to bring something good. Sometimes in life when things are going well, when things go well in our life, we attribute it to the fact that God is good. God must be good. Things are going well. But then what happens when things go bad? We might say that, well, maybe God is against us, or maybe God is punishing me for something. Or maybe, maybe, maybe if God did things this way, a little bit differently, then, then things would turn out better. It's as if we imagine that we can sit down for a cup of coffee with God and we can maybe have a little say in how things should go in, in our life. That's not the kind of God that we have. The kind of God that we have and serve is, is a God whose ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and, and much higher than our thoughts. God's wisdom compared to ours is it's not even compar comparable. God's ways and His ways are much higher and much better than our ways. And so when life is good, God is good. And when, life, when the circumstances of life are bad, God is still good. And God's promises are still good. It was true for Joseph and it's true for you too. And that's what Joseph held on to through all those years. So back to the story of Joseph. Finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison when Pharaoh has some dreams and he needs these dreams to be interpreted. And finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph and says, there was a guy I was in prison with who can interpret dreams. And Joseph gets out of prison then and interprets the Pharaoh's dreams. And the dreams went, were interpreted like this, that there's going to be seven years of plenty in the land and then there are going to be seven years of famine, extreme famine. So Joseph said, said to the Pharaoh, I want you... I I think that you should store up the grain for the seven years and then you will have grain for the years of want. The Pharaoh, the Pharaoh puts him in, second, in place of second command in the land of Egypt and Joseph is in charge of, of storing all the grain, putting it on reserve. In fact, it was so much they couldn't even keep tally of it any longer. And then they had just enough to help not only the land of Egypt, but those also in lands around them that were suffering from the famine during the next seven years. And that included the land of Canaan, where Jacob and his 11 sons and their families lived, the brothers of Joseph. They too needed food. And so Jacob said, I heard that there's food in Egypt, and he sends his sons down to Egypt. And there, what happens when his, when his sons come before Joseph? not recognizing it's Joseph, their brother, they bow down to him. Just as the dreams had said, just as God had said through the dream, it all came true. Joseph's brothers bowed down to him, and eventually Joseph revealed his identity to them as second in command to his brothers. As second in command in Egypt, I should say, he revealed who he was to them. And they were able to be provided for. Joseph's brothers were provided for, but that's not even, that's not even the, the coolest part of the story because what happened after that is even more amazing. The line of Judah was able to be preserved. Judah, the very one who, who said that we should take the life of, of this brother Joseph and who also would be in the line of the Savior. God preserved that line of Judah 
so that the Savior of the world would be, the line of the Savior for you and for me would be preserved. If Joseph hadn't been sold by his brothers, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, forgotten in jail for two years, and then finally restored to this position of honor in Egypt, if all that sequence of events, that scenario of events, if, if none of that had taken place, perhaps the family line of Judah would have died out. But instead, that line was preserved and your Savior and mine, the promise of your Savior and mine was preserved. Remember what, we said th- what we've said throughout all of these stories, that, that all of these Old Testament stories, they find their fulfillment in Jesus. And the story of Joseph is no different. God used all the circumstances, good and bad, to bring you a Savior. Joseph didn't know how God was going to do that, all the details of how a a Messiah would would ultimately be, be sent into this world, but God did. And God knew how his son would be hated by his own brothers. God knew how his son Jesus would be conspired against to be killed and handed over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, to be killed. God knew how his son would be sold not for 20 pieces of silver as Joseph was, but for 30 pieces of silver. And God turned all of it into all this that was meant for evil. He turned it into the greatest good of all, a savior for you and for me. Joseph didn't know how his story would parallel Jesus' story, but he knew about God's ways and God's promises that God works all things for good. His final words to his brother, his final words that are recorded in Genesis to his brothers are in that graphic that I read earlier. God, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Some of Jesus' final words on the cross to those who meant evil and harm against him, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Instead of revenge, Joseph showed nothing but mercy and grace to his brothers who meant harm against him. Joseph showed that mercy and grace. Jesus did the same for us. Instead of revenge against us, he offers forgiveness. He turns to his father when we sin against him and his father, and he says, Father, forgive them for my sake, for the sake of my perfect life and my death on the cross. Forgive your children their sins. Forgive them. We are supposed to follow Jesus' example now. We are unable to follow the example that Jesus gave us perfectly. But by his mercy and grace, we are forgiven. And so when we become like the brothers of Joseph and sin rears its ugly head in our life or or when the consequences of, of sin are there in our life, we pray, Father, forgive us. And by God's grace and mercy, we are forgiven for the sake of his son. We don't always get to see all the reasons that God has for the circumstances, good and bad, that he allows in our life. But we trust that in the good times and in the bad times, God is good. That his promises are good. That God sees the big picture for us and that he is working good at all times. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. We continue by confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Bible says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. God does want our hearts first. Our offerings are then an outpouring of thankfulness to God from our heart. You can give the, uh, by placing an offering in the offering plates. They're in the entryway there. You can also give via text. The number is printed there. Just put a dollar sign in front of the amount you wish to give, and it will send you a secure link uh, at that phone number there. You can also go online to peacelutherantrinity.com. Look for the Donate to Peace button at the bottom of the home page. We continue with the prayer of the church. O Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly, as Jesus taught us. And today we also pray on behalf of the mother of one of our worshipers with us today. We pray for Jean. Lord, we, we, we know that you know all that is going on in Jean's life. And as she is dealing with sickness and illness to her body, we ask that you relieve any pain or suffering that she is going through. Lord, we ask that in her days here on earth that she praise and thank you for all the goodness you have shown her, and most of all, she put her trust in your Son, Jesus, our Savior. We also ask that, that as her, should her days on this earth be, be coming to an end, that you grant her a blessed end, and that you grant her faith and trust in you. Gracious Father, we pray boldly, as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Our closing hymn is a reminder that through all circumstances in life, we can have we find a firm foundation in our Savior and His promises. Thank you.